being grateful for their time and energy. I can't sing in the shower. So I'm grateful whenever people use their gifts uh, to God's glory. So thanks, you guys, for hanging in there with me. We're in session two, last one. Y'all ready? All right. Whether you're ready or not, we're going into it. So this confession uh, may not relate to where you are, and that's okay. But, but here it goes. I feel like an alien. I feel like a dinosaur. That's it. That's what I got to say. But we know from the book of Ecclesiastes uh, that there is nothing new under the sun. Life is what it is. It's a struggle that is made beautiful only by God. It's a sojourn of pure survival for some who hold on for dear life at every turn, white knuckled, because for them the roller coaster is always on the brink of derailment. And for them joy is elusive. Hardship is a language that they know well. Others, however, thrive spiritually, socioeconomically, physically. Not that everything they touch turns to gold, but they enjoy tangible and intangible assets. And most importantly, these people tend to champion a perspective that enables sober-minded, measured, and responsible comportment in this world, or so we hope. And these dynamics are easy enough for us to understand, so I won't belabor the point, but as I've just entered the four-decade line of demarcation in life, I'm 42, I'm feeling increasingly foreign in ways that are more profound than being an African-American immigrant serving here in Canada. My, my status is permanent uh, resident, but, but with all due respect, it, it doesn't feel permanent for me because it's, it's just not home. In more ways than one, I am from a galaxy far, far away. Let me explain. I, I wasn't shaped by religious or faith-based communities as a child. There was no church attendance, no summertime vacation Bible school for me or my family. I came of age in a mixture of volatility and stability, a shaken, not stirred martini of militarized, that is uh, disciplined, predictable living, uh, that kind of life at home. But then on the other hand, I had a kind of lean on me atmosphere at school. I was shy and, and still am, studious, kind, and otherwise an outlier which meant that coming from where I did, you had to fight. And, and so I did. I was never the instigator, but I was taught that if you become the subject of somebody's problem and they begin trying to solve it with their fists, oh, you better defend yourself or else. The, the only Christian I knew as a child was Joseph, a straight-A student who was also my best friend who was caught in a hail of bullets while riding home from church with his brothers one evening. Uh, his life ended at the tender age of 13. Again, I'm, I'm 42 now, so that's a long time ago, but I still remember seeing his photo, his school photo, in the metro section of the Washington Post one Sunday afternoon, detailing how the life of yet another young, gifted black male had been taken. It felt surreal, it felt unfair, and it felt very personal. So, yes, I've, I've had hills to climb, I've had some weary days and some sleepless nights, but, but that's not the cause of my isolation in this particular iteration that I'm going to talk to you guys about this morning. It's, it's more so that the fundamental diet that I was spoon-fed as a child is a world apart from what many, many people, my junior today, are experiencing. And the gulf, if I'm honest, probably only widens in uh, each day that goes by, each month that goes by, each year that goes by. So let me explain. Context clues and rational thought and reading Rainbow with LeVar Burton and where in the world is Carmen Sandiego? These things were my life as a kid. I had chores, 
chores somebody that were non-negotiable. And if I ever were to muster the audacity to even breathe disrespectfully towards one of my teachers or my parents, the consequence would not make for a pretty sight, I'm trying to tell you. The, the only timeouts that I had any familiarity with were uh, football or, or basketball. There, there was no cash app apparatus by which donations could be transferred to fund my adolescent wares. I would scratch and I and I would claw and I would beg and borrow and work. Keyword here, work, like a real job, work at Burger King and Ross for any kind of extra thing that I wanted. And lastly, I, I was taught to write in cursive. <laughs> cursive. Cursive. And and, and and I had to turn in homework assignments that were completed by hand where your fingers were all fatigued from holding the pen or the, or the pencil where it would, it would wear a groove into the side of your finger. You know, pencil sharpeners were, were everywhere. There were the big ones at school, uh, at least at my school, they were always breaking, but, but no fear. Hey, 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 I got a pint-sized version in my book bag. Uh, my little handy dandy trapper keeper uh, I had in my desk, I had them everywhere. And even as word processors, dot matrix printers, and the internet began arriving on the scene, my parents, Bonnie and James Ellis, remained steadfast in making me read books, magazines, comic books, the TV guide. It didn't matter at, at all to them what it was, uh, but I was a kid with boundless energy. I was a little small, a little something. And they had a little afro, and, and, and they were just like, nah, he, he'll get into things. He got to read. He got to read. They tell me, go to your room and, and read something. And then I couldn't just do that. But, but they say, well, when you finish reading, uh, I want you to come and tell me what you read. And, and my parents checked my homework. I mean, it, it probably wasn't until the 11th grade that they kind of cooled off on that a little bit. While recognizing that, that I am not the standard bearer, the, the landscape of how students are assimilated into what it means to learn has changed drastically uh, over, over the past several decades, is all I'm saying. And to me, some of the changes are not necessarily the best. In his book, Good News About Injustice, A Witness of Courage in a Hurting World, Gary A. Haugen asks these questions. He asks, are we raising children to be safe or to be brave? Are we raising our children to be smart or to be loving? If his name doesn't ring a bell, the, the global organization that he founded protects the poor from violence and the developing world. Uh, it's called International Justice Mission or IJM for short, it began in 1999 as Gary, a devout Christian, a devout Anglican, was already a noted human rights attorney based in New York City, who'd eventually landed a job at the Department of Justice in the U.S. He was leading a genocide investigation in Rwanda with a team of international lawyers. Now, I tend to think that Gary and Micah may have gotten along. These latter verses that we're going to consider for a little by a little while today are, are trendier than the former ones that we looked at, especially verse eight. At least in, in some Christian circles today, even if their consistent actions only hit discordant notes that undermine uh, this verse or or if they misinterpret the verse altogether, uh, maybe expressly in the backdrop of pandemics that are both microbiological and racial. Lots of people nowadays want to be counted among those who act justly, who love mercy, and who walk humbly with God. And this is what we find in Micah 6, 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? 
He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Before, God was speaking through Micah. Whereas now, you'll notice the parentheses are gone and he, Micah, is addressing mere mortals on behalf of himself, another mere mortal. He's looking to illumine how foolish their behavior has been. And just to be clear, how we understand justice and mercy and humility is not revealed in an object or a principle. It is revealed in a person. Jesus. He, he was born into scandal, Jesus was, and, and mystery and struggle from the wrong side of the town. After all, the statement was made, you'll remember Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? And although he, he had every ability and every reason to save himself and say, uh, thanks but no thanks to saving humanity, Jesus chose the ultimate sacrifice. His life was taken in, in one sense, but even more, it was lovingly surrendered. He is the archetype we want to represent. But there's only one Jesus, and none of us are him. The, the cruciform life that we accept by grace through faith is about the complement, not the competition of faith and works, orthodoxy and orthopraxy, justification and sanctification. We are unable to be mini-me's of Jesus. Jesus is Jesus. We follow Jesus, and that's it. We on the same page? Praise the Lord. What's, what's fascinating about this section of Micah 6, I think, is how twisted we can make it. For example, as lives are lost at record numbers to a common, invisible, and potent enemy... How is it that Christ's followers would reason that refusing or denigrating inoculation and measures to stop the virus's spread reflects anything related to justice and mercy and humility? I'm just saying, for me, it's absurd that a Christian can justify throwing temper tantrums about wearing masks or submitting to travel passports because of their rights in the face of the Pauline admonition to value others above yourselves. It's, it's kind of hard to authenticate that you love God with everything and you love your neighbor as yourself if you won't take the basic best steps that we have available to preserve as many lives as possible with God's help. Just as false prophets will be known by their fruit, the same is true for Christians. And also, while I'm at it, there are those who will quickly contend uh, more than most. Oh, I mean, you don't understand. I, I know how to act and to love and to walk. But, but they'll abandon the adjective altogether. The, the acting here in the text isn't about winning an Emmy or an Oscar. We don't want believers aiming to defraud the world about their commitment to justice. But when Breonna Taylor and when George Floyd and when Ahmaud Arbery are, are killed in the States and, and now thousands of bodies of indigenous children are discovered testifying to us from unmarked graves here in Canada at, at former uh, indigenous residential school sites and the response of some Christians is to argue that systemic racism is not real. Or that though the, the colonizing mandate to kill the Indian and save the man was bad, yeah, but it wasn't that bad. And people should just stop complaining and move on. I, I'd like to, to think that we can appreciate how troubling that is. How, how that should cause me some problems if I follow Jesus. Now, I don't have the time to dig into all of them, but I want to offer just a few correctives about one of the, the three main nouns that we see in this text. The noun I'm going to focus on is love, L-O-V-E. What is love? Is it purely pleasure? 
Is it a life that is free from boundaries and guardrails because love never says no? Jesus says that he came not to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. And in that deferential allegiance to God the Father, that's the context by which he died. He did, Jesus did what what he wanted uh, taken from his flesh, in his spirit, he, he knew was a better option. So he chose to die for us and to obey God the Father. He sacrificed, is all I'm trying to say. So, so pretty much, no matter how you slice it, love is part noun and it's part verb. It has emotive qualities and, and tangible, discernible action. It has both. It's a commitment to someone or something to sacrificially benefit the someone or the something. If your significant other or spouse says that they love you only to spend time with everybody in their mama but you, it makes sense that you would wonder if they properly understand what love is. If a parent showers their child with gifts and prays exclusively and skips over ever levying healthy structure, healthy discipline, then love has been compromised. I'm here to tell you this morning, scripture is clear that the Lord disciplines those he loves. So, so this can't be your pie in the sky, you know, we are the world, kumbaya, happy-go-lucky experience. If you want me to believe that you, in the case of verse 8, love mercy, well, there's got to be some food on the plate that I can eat. We aren't always as loving as we ought to be, and, and everyone would be better off if we could just confess that, be honest, uh, be humble, take a little seat, sit down somewhere, and experience the blessing of koinonia, or Christian relationships and community, and have some correction and some healing. You ain't got to say amen, it's all right. If there's one book that, that might scare you straight or, or I mean, uh, challenge you to face the maladaptive shortcomings of this generation head on, it's this book, Lost in Transition, The Dark Side of Emerging Adulthood. It's by Christian Smith. And in this book, he writes, young people need to be loved. To put it as plainly as possible, they need to be engaged, challenged, mentored, and enjoyed. He goes on to say they, like every human being, need to be appropriately cared for no matter how autonomous and self-sufficient they may think they are. Now, I think that all of us can affirm that truth, frankly, I'm just going to be honest, some young people get on my nerves. And I'm just here to tell you, it's okay to say that. Maybe not in front of them, but, but you can just be honest. Being It doesn't make you a terrible educator. It makes you a human being who has uh, you know, experiences in life. Nevertheless, they, they are who they are partly because of us because of how society has morphed into what it is, whereby so much we perhaps took for granted, they, they just can't even comprehend. Despite what does or, or does not happen in their home, many of today's students only know divorce and polyamorous living where cohabitation is the common norm. All they know is allegiance to an acronym that every time you look up has expanded yet again as an unrecognized admission, I would argue, of its hollowness. They've been told that inclusivity is the only way. So when self-made inclusivity advocates begin excluding them based on one or two variables that no longer fit the game's politics, it, it sends them, these young kids, into a dark spiral. And someone has to show them a less traveled, unpopular way that isn't likely to be tweeted about. It won't trend on Instagram, but it will save their life 
That way is not an idea. It's not a concept. It's a person. His name is Jesus. Now, we, we want them to be educated. We just don't want them to be educated fools. We want them to get an education, but we don't want them to walk around like they're hot stuff and they, they can't do the functional things in life, much less the deeper things in life that are required. As I said, I'm, I'm not an educator classically, so I can't provide you with instruction about classroom management or, or how to, to teach better introductory algebra. But, and, and that's important stuff. I can say, however, that you cannot properly educate kids if your highest aim for them is survival by North American standards. It cannot be about them matriculating through life one day uh, so that they'll have a church that they barely go to, but they call themselves a, a, a regular attender. And they'll, they'll be the kind of people that are in church, but they're, they're not. The church isn't in them, that it's a movement from the inside out. They, they may, though, have a, a decent job. You know, they'll brew beer in their basement. They'll, they'll shuttle their kids to like 200 sports practices every week. And they'll think that they're taking their health seriously because sometimes they take the stairs at work up to the second floor. But I'm, I, when I have conversations with a lot of these young adults, I tell them that that's not going to get it. I have higher aims for you. I want a generation of people who will serve God in their youth while they can, who, who will know that tomorrow is not promised. I mean, five minutes from now is not promised. I, I want a generation who will learn from my foolish mistakes. But that means that I have to tell some of them some, not all, of, of what went down and, and how God was with me through everything. If, if, if your heart's desire is to see the students in your care, to act justly, to, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God, you, you don't need to take on the weight of the world. That's only going to result in your ruin. Instead, you need to be a godly educator who leads by example, who empathizes with their struggles, but will not uphold error. The X's and O's, I'm telling you, I'm not an educator, but they matter. You want people who can calculate things correctly. You want people who can you know, do all the things that they need to do, who can put a, a good sentence together. These are important life skills, but, but better that someone has tough conversations with them now than for them to turn 29 one day and, and never have experienced someone who loves them enough to tell them the stone cold truth. And it's going to take a village to see them through to the other side. You can't do it by yourself. You, you can only roll up your sleeves. You can be the change that you want to see in the world and you can do your part faithfully. Again, a, a framework of post-truth, pornography, Excess, comparison, voyeurism, and ease, like soft landings, is what most of them know best. Social media promotes it. Movies exploit it. Friends gossip about it. And often enough, parents and adults co-sign it. But the gospel has not been preserved for 2,000 some odd years in abundance and persecution in Asia and Australia, in good times and bad times, taking hold in factories and remote villages, being whispered among slaves while they picked cotton because the people of God were afraid of their youth. This semester um, at Trinity Western in chapel, uh, I have us preaching through the entirety of the book of Esther. It's a small book, so it gives us enough time to kind of really get through through all of it. And a friend of mine uh, who pastors a church in Lemoore, California, a uh, Presbyterian congregation, he preached in the series a couple of weeks ago, and he said this in his sermon. He said that you can't scare dead people. And, and he was speaking to the notion that in baptism, we, we die in any allegiance to the enemy of God. And, and symbolically, as we come out the water, we're identified with the new the internal uh, beginning that we have in Christ. We are no longer governed by likes or anxiety or persecution. Instead, 
we let our broken and contrite heart shine. That in humility, we will inherit the earth and a remnant and be a remnant that the Lord will use for his kingdom purposes where the first is last. The last is first. This this upside down kingdom agenda is fulfilled and God is glorified. Can I pray for you guys? Let's pray. Gracious, loving God, our Father, we thank you, uh, Lord, that you give us life and that you give us life more abundantly. God, would you help us to be good stewards of all that you've given us, Lord? There's nothing that we've earned. We didn't earn the right to wake up this morning. We haven't earned the right to employment. We haven't earned the privileges that we have, God. You, you've just given it to us, and so we're, we're grateful. Help us to steward it well. God, I pray for, for all of these educators, those that are tuning in online, those that are here in person, God, that you would captivate them, that in whatever they teach and whatever they coach and whatever they administer over and, and whatever they do, God, that they would be animated by the gospel in doing it. And God, that as they need help along the way, because let's be honest, we all need help. There is no Lone Ranger Christianity where we have it all figured out as they need help. God, I pray that you would bring uh, surprising resources to their feet. God, people and places and opportunities where they can be encouraged and challenged, that they can know that we're so proud of them for the job that they do. Uh, God, and we want them to be whole people because a, a whole teacher is going to make uh, a much better impact in the world than, than someone, God, who's siloed off and, and is just, you know, co compartmentalized in their life, God. So so give them a holistic victory, God, it, it, even now in advance. Uh, God, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for what you're doing. And we thank you for what you're going to do in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, you guys.